Vyasam Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Nama Sahami Well, I hope everybody had a good sit. Um, hope everybody had a good sit. And that that exercise of uh, really bringing to mind what your, what your why is for meditation, uh, I hope that was a fruitful exercise. Um, just curious, I'll probably ask again after uh, sharing for a bit, but if anyone could just maybe in two or three words, if you just wanted to share and call out what your what your hope is, or this uh, this wish for the practice? Um, anybody can just no need to wait for a mic um, for peace, yeah, and liberation. Expansive love, great. Chill vibes. Chill vibes. Nice. Letting go. To be in the body. Awesome. Clarity. Yeah. Seeing through obscurations. Clear seeing. Wonderful. Appreciation. Bringing mind back to its home. Fantastic. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, and that wasn't a test. It's not like there's one right answer. Like, everybody has to say nirvana, and or else it's wrong. Um, but there really is a place in, in Theravada Buddhism um, for, in Buddhism as a whole, for, for wishes, for, for having hopes in, in meditation. And it's good to be, be conscious of, of what those are, uh, or else they might just be subterranean. You have no idea why you're here. Um, or it's a mix of motives that are maybe coming from all over the place. Uh, and it's not the case. The Buddha doesn't promise that you know, all wishes can be fulfilled. Like if your wish during the meditation was, oh, that the heating system might not click so much then you might, uh, yeah, it might be depressing. You might leave um, before things got started. So, uh, but there is a large place for uh, ways to train the mind, both inside meditation and outside meditation, which can lead to all of the, I think everyone who shared really had quite wholesome, wholesome wishes on almost on a spiritual level. Everyone who said things like peace and expansiveness and uh, acceptance, these are all spiritual virtues, and certainly that's uh, really at the heart of why many of us come here. Uh, but the Buddha also spoke about more what could be considered like worldly, uh, worldly considerations, worldly hopes, and how uh, through certain exercises, through certain practices, uh, we can actually achieve those as well. Uh, I'm thinking in particular, there's a wonderful sutta, uh, uh, discourse by the Buddha in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is the middle link discourses of the Buddha. Uh, discourse number six called the Akankeya Sutta. And Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's the main translator uh, of that text, the most widely available version, he translates it as, if a bhikkhu should wish. Uh, but really there's no, uh, bhikkhu means monk. There's no monk necessary in that title. It really literally just means if one might wish, or if someone has the hope, or someone may hope. And that's what the, the whole discourse is about. And he goes through, uh, it's a list of 17 different things which people might hope. And uh, yes, yeah, some of them are just quite uh, mundane. Um, people might be familiar with a list of the eight worldly wins so this is four sets of two. These are, and you can remember them, 
the memory technique is the four P's. So you've got pleasure and pain, pleasure and pain, that's one P. Then you've got profit and loss, that's a second P. Then you've got praise and blame, third P, and popularity and disrepute. So these four, uh, four sets of two, pleasure, profit, praise, popularity, and they're opposites. And this list uh, of 17 different things people can wish really is inclusive of all of these. So the first one, uh, the Buddha starts out, uh, one might wish, may I be dear and, uh, may I be dear and, uh, and may I be dear and endearing to my friends in the holy life, to my good friends. Uh, may I be respected and held in high regard by them. And this is a desire for, for praise and for some level of popularity. And uh, the Buddha allowed it. It's, and it's so human. I mean, we want people to like us. We want people to like us. And when you come to a, a monastery, you don't have to just pretend that that doesn't exist, like that you don't want the other monks and the other nuns and all of the, you know, your fellow practitioners, the people sitting next to you. You don't have to pretend like you don't want them to think you're a good meditator or a good person. Um, this is allowable. And if that's part of our consciousness, if part of us does really care what people think about us, then the Buddha continued, if one might wish, may I be dear and agreeable to my friends in the holy life, to my good friends, respected and held in high esteem by then, then let one do five things. And these are the five things which I'm hoping everybody can memorize for this morning. And uh, we'll give some memory techniques for memori memorizing those. But these five repeat for all 17 of the different wishes which humans have when they come to spiritual practice. Uh, so the first one, so if you want to be liked by good people, then the first one is let one fulfill the precepts. So this is let one, uh, the Pali is literally, let one thoroughly uh, immerse oneself in the sila or uh, good habits, in, in good behavior, in morality, in principles, in principled living. Um, that's the first thing, okay? And it's like, uh, yeah, let one be uh, fulfilled in precepts. You can think of that filling down the head. It's almost if you're filling the body. All of the, these memory techniques are going to be dealing with the body because we're always with the body. So let one fulfill themselves in the precepts. The second one is let one be devoted to internal serenity of mind. Let one be devoted to internal serenity of mind. This will lead to being dear and agreeable to good people. Uh, being devoted to internal serenity of mind. Ajatang, cheto, samatang, anuyuto. So this final Pali word, which is translated as be devoted to, is literally anuyuj, which is the same root as the Pali and Sanskrit word yoga. So in, in yoga practice, what you're doing is you're, you, you're yoking your mind, your breath, to these different postures, if it's hatha yoga. You're yoking the mind, the breath, as you do different poses. And in this Buddhist context, what we're yoking the mind to is to internal serenity. So rather than being obsessed, as most of us do, if I want to be liked by someone, then I just start thinking about how I can, uh, yeah, what I can do, how can I um, yeah, scheme to make this person like me, to do some, you know, change some aspect of my character or clean up my house, do the dishes or whatever so that uh, so-and-so likes me better. Uh, and that's great. It's always people like it when you do the dishes. Um, but also keeping the mind uh, yoked to this internal serenity of mind, devoted to this internal serenity of mind. It's like, um, yeah, it, it is cognate, the word yoga and anuyunjati, the verb, is cognate the Sanskrit Pali word is related to the English word uh, like a, a yoke, like a yoke for a plow. And most of us didn't grow up using plow animals uh, or plows. Um, but in a modern American context, you can think about it like a hitch on the back of a truck. So you're hitching yourself to this internal serenity of mind 
or like, uh, you know, if you're, I saw, I saw a, it's a dog leash that cost $26 that uh, not only, what, you didn't have to hold it in your hand, you could just strap it around your body and it had a little extra strap that came out here so you could just like walk along and not have to hold your dog, which is exciting. Um, or, you know, sometimes people have these leashes for their children. So these are like modern day versions of the, the yoke. You're yoking yourself. You're uh, creating this connection and maintaining the connection over time to this thing which you think is important, which is internal serenity, samatha of mind. That's the second thing. That's we're fulfilling ourselves with the precepts and letting the internal serenity in the head area, uh, really the whole body, but think of it in the head. So this is serenity. And then the next step, uh, which will lead to all of these 17 hopes being fulfilled, is not neglecting meditation. That's Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. The literal Pali is not neglecting jhana, not neglecting jhana. So this is a, a Pali word which literally means absorption or uh, immersion. And it really is a, a deep state, a very deep state of concentration. Um, I think Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation of it is great because to get to these very deep states of concentration where we're fully absorbed in our object, we have to meditate. Um, not all meditation is jhana, but all jhana is meditation. So starting off where we are, not neglecting meditation. Uh, in certain Buddhist circles, um, there is an insight to be had at some point that actually the truth of non-self is always true. You know, there's no, <laughs> there's no ego inherent in the same con continuing all the time underneath everything. That insight is always true. And it's going to be true whether I'm meditating or whether I'm not meditating. So some people say there's no need to practice jhana. Uh, but in this list, and again and again and again and again, and like a bunch more agains in the suttas, the Buddha really does say, yeah, don't neglect meditation. So it's very true that we need to practice mindfulness coming back to our center, coming back to a space of uh, non-ego obsession, uh, but also doing it on the cushion. There is a place for cushion practice uh, in our lives, in a Buddhist, in this, in this framework. Um, so respecting that, not neglecting meditation, uh, not letting go of jhana. So this is maybe in the, the heart space. The next, the fourth of these qualities for fulfilling our, our hopes and our wishes is maybe more in the core. And this is uh, being, um, uh, being possessed of insight. So the word here is vipassana. So being endowed or possessed with insight. Um, and this is something we can do on the cushion and off the cushion and something which will lead good people to like us. That's great. Um, so here in a Theravada context, uh, vipassana is literally seeing, clear seeing of the truth of impermanence, that nothing lasts, that uh, there is an aspect of unsatisfactoriness, um, that nothing is as perfect as it could be. Sangsara is an imperfect place, to say the least. And that, yet yeah, this truth of not self, there's no inherent me behind it all. There's no, uh, uh, yeah, not, not self, seeing and exploring that truth and looking, is that true? Is that true? And uh, continuing to look at this. This is uh, being possessed of or being endowed with vipassana, with, endowed with insight. And the fifth thing that will make people like you and a bunch of other things, if you don't care if people like you or not, uh, I'll tell you the other great things in a minute. Uh, but the fifth one is, and this is fascinating, especially with regards to getting people, uh, yeah, getting good people to think favorably of you, is to uh, dwell in empty huts, dwell in empty huts. And that's Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. And uh, the word is not, it's not necessarily huts. It can be an empty room. It can be where you go camping. It can be empty space. It can be on the top of a mountain. It can be a closet, dwelling in empty closets. Um, you know, wherever is a space where you can actually get away from uh, what the world is telling you about yourself and really come back and see actually what is 
the truth of my experience right now. Um, dwelling, spending time with, associating, bruheta is the strange Pali word, uh, but associating with these other places that are by, by oneself. And uh, there's also insight to be had here. This is something which, if we can schedule time in our days, every day, if possible, scheduling in however much time you can uh, to do this, uh, or certainly in your weeks or your month or your year, have that 10-day retreat, have that month-long retreat, have that day of the week, which is your, your Sabbath, uh, have that period of the day, five minutes, 10 minutes. We have a half-hour afternoon sit on Zoom, which we do together. We have a morning sit from four to five in the morning, which many people here come to. Uh, and in a sense, I'm still just in my hut. Even though I've got Zoom on and there's like a bunch of squares and rectangles and I see people, but I'm in my, my hut by myself actually coming to a place of, um, yeah, it is, it, is, uh, it is a still and alone place. And eventually having the insights that every place can be an empty room. Uh, there's really no one home. You know, it's a, there's a great Tibetan metaphor about um, if there's no one home and nothing to steal, then you don't have to worry about thieves. And that insight, uh, just seeing that, yeah, there's no, uh, there's no huge self here that I need to always protect. So those are the five things. Um, and that's dwelling in empty huts. That's the bottom one, like the base, you know, sitting on the ground of, of my hut, sitting on the ground of my empty space. So just uh, as a quick test, and I might test everybody again, but the first one, does anybody remember the first thing which leads to? Precepts, precepts exactly. Being fulfilled in the precepts. And the second one? Yes, being devoted to internal serenity of mind. Internal serenity of mind. And the third? Yes, not neglecting meditation. And the fourth? Yes, being uh, endowed with or possessed of vipassana, practicing insight. And the fifth? That's right, that's right, that's right. The ground, what we're sitting on, the dwelling in, in empty huts. And uh, there's a beautiful other discourse where the Buddha, it's called the, the lesser discourse on, um, on emptiness. And the Buddha talks about the perception of emptiness. And he says, you have a forest monastery, and when you're in the forest monastery, even if there are a bunch of other monks around, you can say, this place I'm in, you can nurture this perception. It is empty of all of the sounds and going on and fluster and bluster of the city. This monastery, this forest monastery, it is full with other monks. It's full of whatever I've got going in my mind, but it's empty of the clamor of the city. And so similarly, we're here, we're in the triple gym, that's what we call this place sometimes, and we're with good Kalyanamitta. It's empty of, of fear to some extent. This is a, this is a safe space. And uh, yeah, so acknowledging that this space uh, is, is empty of certain things and, and cultivating those empty spaces. So these five things will lead to, if one wishes, may I be dear and agreeable to my spiritual companions in the holy life, uh, then one should do these five things. The next things that the uh, Buddha says one might wish for are in the realm of gains. So it's, he's speaking to monks. So he says, what do monks want? We want robes and we want like alms food. We want some food in our bowl and we want like a nice hut and we want some medicines from time to time. And so the Buddha frames it like that. So a monk might wish, may I gain robes, alms food, a lodging, and medicines. If a monk might wish that, then let them fulfill the precepts, be devoted to internal serenity of mind, not neglect seclusion, be possessed of insight, and dwell in empty huts. Uh, and the, all these requisites will either come or you'll realize as you're <laughs> coming more inward that you don't need, I don't need as much food, clothing, all this stuff as I wanted. And uh, a, a modicum, you know, will, I, I'll, get, I'll get the basics. I already have the basics of these things. So how that transfers to 
uh, non-monastics. My Pali and Sanskrit teacher at the university, he's a, a very serious meditator in the Goenka tradition. I was just talking with him on Thursday. We have a Pali class. And he said that in his opinion, when the Buddha talks to monks, he doesn't mean just monks, ever. He's always applying it to, to lay people. So I was surprised that he would make such a, an emphatic statement. Um, and there are places which might stretch that, um, stretch that expansive perception. But certainly it's oftentimes very much the case. But to what extent might it be true? Yeah, uh, if a lay person, a practitioner might wish, may I have the basics of those material things which I need, then let them do these five things. To what extent might that be true? Uh, and yeah, maybe, um, maybe the world will provide more than you, than you think. Maybe goodness that you're creating will provide more than you think. Uh, some of the next things that the Buddha brings up that one could wish for, one might wish, may I be, may I conquer discontent and may I not be overcome by discontent. Um, hopefully everybody can identify with this. Uh, when you go on your first meditation retreats, it's so, I won't say depressing, but it sucks. You see, I'm in this great place and why can't I just be happy? I got food in my belly, and I can just sit here for hours. Isn't that what I wanted? Like, I came here, um, and I just can't. Why am I not happy? Why can't I just be content with what is right now? Why can't I just be content right now? And this is, uh, I think it was Pascal. I know one French phrase, and I will not impose it on you because I still can't pronounce it correctly. But if you speak French, come up, to, come up to me afterwards and help me with my French pronunciation. But the quote is, all of humanity's problems stem from the human inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Isn't that weird? Doesn't that suck? Like, why can't we just do that? I mean, we wouldn't have to go out and you know, do all these things that think will, we think will make us happy if we could just, I'm just happy here. I don't even need direct TV. I don't even need like, internet service. My computer's broke. So what? Um, but we can't do that yet. So we come and, and train in this ability. So may I conquer discontent and do that? Fulfill the precepts, be devoted to internal serenity of mind, not neglect meditation, be possessed of insight, and dwell in empty huts. Uh, the next things uh, address um, yeah, more spiritual goals. So the Buddha said, if someone might wish, may I easily attain the four jhanas, easily attain the four, these four immersions. So this is a very clear and explicit goal of a, a spiritual practice, uh, a Buddhist monastic life. May I quickly attain these jhanas, then one should do these five things. If one has the wish, may I quickly attain the five or four immaterial jhanas, one should do these things. One might wish, may I attain stream entry, so for people who don't know, this is somewhat Buddhist jargon, but uh, the Buddha spoke about four different levels of awakening. It really does kind of sound like a video game, but the Buddha, it is framed in this way that through a training of the heart, there does come a time when you beat that level. The level of what? The level of doubt, the level of attachment to rites and rituals, the level of attachment to a view of personality. Uh, that's... When you attain stream entry, you've beaten that level. You're, you're done. Uh, the Buddha says that you only got seven more lives. Um, it, that also fits in with, well with the uh, video game analogy. Uh, but, but great, but it's not like after those seven lives, then you're, you're done. But within those seven lives, you will complete the video game. You will achieve our hardship. Pure, you've totally gotten rid of greed, anger, and delusion. So the other stages of enlightenment, four of them, if you want to be a non-returner, that's the second phase, then do these five things. If you want to be a once-returner, do these five things. If you want to achieve that liberation of mind, liberation by wisdom, with which the noble ones, that is, people who are awakened, dwell in right now, then one should cultivate these five things. That is, fulfill the precepts, be devoted to internal serenity of mind, not neglect meditation, be possessed of insight, and dwell in empty huts. So it's very, it's very practical. It's very, very practical. And um, some people um, come to 
Buddhism, maybe especially in America, and say, actually, I don't want anything practical. You know, the Buddhist path is all about transcendence and all this talk about, you know, wanting to be, be a good friend or wanting to make friends along the path or, you know, wanting to get anything along the path. That's the exact opposite. We're supposed to be letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. And we are supposed to be letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. Uh, but there is a place. The Buddha was so wise. He spoke to people. He spoke to us where we are. We do still have these, these hopes and these aspirations on the path. And you don't have to spiritual bypass and pretend like they don't exist. Yeah, I want people to like me. Uh, I want to attain the jhanas. Um, you know, I have these very real human animal wishes. I want to be, uh, I want to be warm, you know, at night. Um, so, yeah, how do I do that? I can actually cultivate these five things. So, hopefully everybody has memorized those. And if not, I think this will be recorded and you can watch it again. Um, so, yeah, maybe just leave things there and open it up to questions. Do we have another mic today? We do. Okay, great. All right. So if anyone has a question here. Um, okay, and actually we have a question on, or a comment on YouTube perhaps. Is that Joseph? Or, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where can I buy the chanting book? Do you know? Yeah. There is a link in the... Uh, um, print on demand by Geary. Oh, print on demand. Okay, great. There's no, yeah, can't request a copy. Yeah, there's certainly PDFs available for free. There's a link to that in the notes on YouTube. Um, but people can also, yeah, you can't really, you could either request one if you sent a request to a by Geary, or if you just go... Or you can go to the you can go to the Abayagiri uh, website, and they've actually got um, yeah a print on demand section. Um, it's probably better than actually requesting a copy. So, right. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, let's go Alejandro. Thank you. Hajom Kovilo. Sometimes I think it's easier to understand non-self than self. So is, do you have a definition that everyone in this room could agree on is self? Because I, when I ask people this question, it's like we're all starting from different starting points on what we even think the self is. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question about the Buddha very explicitly defines what he means by, by not-self. If you go to the uh, discourse on not-self, the Anattalakana Sutta, I don't think it's in this chanting book, but it's in the companion volume. If you go to Amaravati chanting book, uh, volume two, the whole of the discourse on not-self is there. And the Buddha defines not-self there um, as, uh, what do you think, uh, bhikkhus, are form-feeling, um, uh, perception, cognition, or consciousness, permanent or impermanent. So those five things are basically what most people think are self. I am, I'm my body, I'm my body. Before you look at it, before you came to, to Buddhism and kind of got, got shook up, uh, you think I'm my body, or I'm, I'm certainly my feelings, or I'm certainly my thoughts, I am how I see the world, I'm definitely my consciousness. But uh, are those permanent or impermanent? So the Buddha defined not self as um, a self which does not, uh, that there's no self which is permanent. So what people think of oftentimes of self are the permanence of any of those five things. Um, is that which is permanent, painful or pleasurable is the next question. And 
his audience, the five first disciples, say um, dukkha. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, in suffering. It's it's not um, it's unsatisfactory. These five things. Why? Because they change. So most people think that these five things are uh, unchanging and that they're pleasant. There's something inherently um, pleasant in some of them, perhaps, before you look deeply or before you get old and sick and et cetera. Um, and then, is it worthy of considering this is mine, I am this, this is myself? And um, yeah, the Buddha said that you can't really find a self that uh, does that. And those are the things where the Buddha said are not, not self. In terms of why some people balk at this teaching of not self, is it say, actually there is a level of self when I gave that instruction of, you can put down your boundaries. You can put down your boundaries in the meditation. That's a great thing to do in meditation, but there might be, and there is a place for boundaries in daily life around your body, around your feeling of safety in the world. Uh, and there is a, some level of, of self there. Like people know me when I come in the, the room, they don't say Nisibo, they say Kovilo, um, there is a continuity of these perceptions, but um, they just don't live up to all there. Did that really address what you were speaking to? Um, no, it, it helps. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, people refer to me as Covilo or him as me quite often. We, uh, we switched places on alms round for a few weeks without anyone really... I think they picked up on it after a while. <laughs> Um, I think Ajahn Kovilo's answer really hits to the, the, car, the whole core of it. Those, the first three suttas the Buddha uh, taught, the turning of the wheel of Dhamma, dealing with the Four Noble Truths and the eightfold, Noble Eightfold Path, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, not self, dealing with the impermanence of the five aggregates, and then the Adita Pariyaya Sutta, the fire sermon on the sense bases. Those are called the three cardinal suttas because they were so core. Um, and there's a very useful analogy the Buddha gives in another discourse in the middle length discourses in response to someone asking exactly about not self and it's a king. And he says, uh, king, do you consider uh, the realm next to yours? Could you give orders in that realm and they would be followed? And the king says, no. And he says, so it's not yours. And this uh, ethic of control, what we have control over being a self, makes a lot of sense. It's, I find that's a very intuitive analogy um, and, and helpful. And I think it's also useful to the Anatta Lakana Sutta, which Ajahn Kovilo is referencing. At the end of each contemplation of each aggregate, the Buddha says, uh, Therefore, this is not me, not mine, not myself. Netang mama neso asmi no me no me aso atati. I just said that terrible Pali, but uh, thank you. Um, but uh, those three ways we create self of netang mama, this is or etang mama, this is mine, and that's uh, craving based, and that's I've heard it called the owning self, and then. Uh, Eso asmi, um, this, uh, like, uh, how do I put that? This is me. Um, and that's the being self. That's like the sense of, of being. Uh, and then, eso uh, me atati, this is myself. And that's the narrative self, the story we draw. Uh, the, yeah, the sort of one based on view. So I find those are really interesting ways of looking at how we create the sense of self too. Kirk, please. And Joseph. Thank you, um, Aljans. I just wanted to uh, express my gratitude for this teaching. Um, I've been trying to find a way to repay your gra uh, repay your kindness for teaching me things like heart space and the field of welcome. So I'll try to cultivate these five practices in gratitude for your immense kindness. You gave me a, a, an immeasurable gift today because um, I've been drawn to this image in the Mahayana tradition of Amoga Pasha right here. Apparently, Lama Zopa Rinpoche said just seeing this image is a great gift. 
And I just realized that everything he's saying is what you just taught. So his hand is virtuous. He has the yoke, the, the unfailing lasso. Then he has the flower for a meditative absorption. And then the, uh, the trident that uh, hits the three poisons, which is in, uh, insight. And then the Buddha's on top dwelling in solitude. So I've always thought this image was so beautiful. And it just kind of, in one image, it's just everything you just taught. And you just explained it to me. And I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. May you be triple blissful. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah, so kind. Thanks for showing us that. Um, you actually reminded me of one of the wishes which might not be so common in uh, American Buddhism or in American circles like this, but is that if one might wish, may my family and those close to me who have passed away, when they think about me, may that lead to their long-term welfare and happiness. Um, what does that imply? It implies rebirth. Um, so that's why it's might not, not so popular in secular Western circles. But I think it's really important for someone who does have an openness to, to rebirth, that the body dies, we take our last breath, um, the brain dies, and that's the end of the story. If you're open to something else, this belief, which is talked about again and again in the Pali Canon, um, not just as a belief, but a, as a you know, clear insight that the Buddha saw, um, that you can actually dedicate your practice to be a support for people who've passed away that you care about. So we've got, we've mentioned uh, Bonnie, who is Juanita, uh, Juanita's husband, Jeff's. So Jeff's mother, um, she passed away on yesterday. yesterday. And um, yeah, this is a, a practice we can do. And it's so sad that uh, in America, <laughs> we don't really remember uh, our relatives when they've passed away. We don't have rituals for, for thinking about them, much less do we have anything that we can do about that. But this wish here in this discourse gives us something to do. If I have the wish, and so my grandmother, uh, her birthday, she passed away. She passed away about four or five years ago. Um, her birthday and anniversary are tomorrow. So if you have a, a milestone of one of your family members, um, you know, significant days and they've passed away, if this thought comes up, yeah, may my relative, when they think about me, if when they've passed, when they think about me, uh, may it bring them gladness, may it lead to their happiness and well-being. And uh, I thought about this. Tomorrow we're going to Fauntleroy Church. It's a, um, a church in West Seattle um, that we will be doing our end of the year vigil at. And we'll be there. And it's great because my grandma was Christian and I'm thinking, yeah, I had this thought that, oh, it'll be awesome. Say my grandma, she looks down, where is, where is young Covilo? Where is Covilo these days? And she looks down and I'm in a church and uh, <laughs> she'll be psyched. Um, so I thought that was a good way to spend uh, uh, memoration uh, in remembrance of her. And we did also suggest um, that Juanita and Jeff just light a candle and um, yeah, dedicating your practice, dedicating these different wholesome things that you can do to uh, your relatives. Just, uh, I'm really glad Ajahn Kovilo brought up that one line because it's significant in that when we have people in our lives, like our parents who don't, uh, or a partner or a friend who we care about who doesn't understand our practice, our faith, and maybe even draws away from us because of it or we find ourselves falling away from them because of personality or view or religion. I feel like this is the Buddha indicating that there's a moment after death with clarity where even those we're closest to who we haven't been able to communicate with in this life around what's deepest in our hearts uh, can feel and be brightened by that. And that, uh, that transmission of goodness occurs outside of what we understand too. So I think it's worth taking heart in that too. And we will have Ajahn Kovilo in a church tomorrow. So. Does anyone else here have a question? Yeah, Cheryl. There's a couple of things here. <clears throat> One is I, I'm just struck over and over again, especially lately, maybe in the last you know, few months, how Sila is the foundation 
of just about all the teachings, and, and here is the first thing in the list, just how important sila is in following the five precepts. That creates the trust, and it creates the safety. Um, the other one is, is, is I've been lately um, <clears throat> offering merit to my brother, who's a year younger than me, and just, you know, a very, very unhappy, unstable person, and and, and this is another way, it's a, a wish for him rather than, rather than offering merit. It's, this is, I'm, I'm gonna like read this sutta. <laughs> but yeah, it just feels like there's another way to offer, you know, offer something to somebody I love very dearly. So thank you for this teaching. Sadhu, that's fantastic. Thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, please. Kirk, or sorry, Prakriti. Yeah, what was your name? I don't think I've met you before. Oh, um, Pragati. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for your wonderful Dhamma talk, Ajahn Kovalo. It's really nice to meet you. And um, I, I had a question about the second of the five things you talked about. I just wanted some guidance on how um, we can work on cultivating the internal serenity. Thank you. I mean, one real clear like shift of awareness, which I think helps me with that, is so much of our daily life is outwards. You know, I'm constantly scanning, you know, who's looking, just subconsciously looking for danger or looking for some kind of support or um, something, just constantly scanning outwards, outwards, outwards. So this coming back inwards. And one thing that helps me with that, because largely it is, you know, the, it's not like the mind like escapes through the pupil or something to run after um, what I'm wanting from someone. Um, but actively bring the mind, see if you can feel the back of your head. So it's almost like a boomerang effect. Or like if you, I'm so used to going out, going out, going out. Uh, and then just actually, what does the back of my head feel like right now? It's almost like you're anchoring yourself back or your whole back, the feeling of the whole back. And that's a way to get internal. It seems like you're just feeling one part of your body, but um, it's, it's like a, you know, if a, a wire or something is so used to being bent this way, you kind of needed to bring it back further to actually have it be balanced. So that's kind of a skillful means to come back into the body. Is what does my back feel like? The back of my head, the back of my body. And uh, so that's in, in daily life. You can also do that in meditation, but... Um, general, I think Ajahn Nisibo and I both will speak a lot about uh, mindfulness of the body. So that's being embodied I, I, is what that's, that's speaking to. Uh, Ajahn? That, was that clear at all? Yeah, I think that yeah. makes sense. It's more like uh, mindfulness, but not only while meditating, but while we're going about our daily lives, being aware of the body and the sensations in the body and bringing attention back to the sensations. Is that right? Yep, that is. And um, being devoted to that, that process mm -hmm. and um, inducing, inclining towards calm, samatha, tranquility of that process. So if you're moving about, if it is daily life practice, you can actually, what if I was to walk a little bit more mindfully or walk a little bit more quietly? Um, that can be another skillful means. Yeah. We usually would have more time for questions. Uh, we have something we do need to do, but I think we have room for one more actually, if, if you had one. Um, thank you for the teaching. Um, I'd like your guidance on um, the um, internal serenity versus adita, like endurance, though both of them are um, Buddhist um, concepts, I think. Um, I wonder how to, because sometimes I, con I, I confuse myself with the internal serenity ver versus just being lazy. Um, as a, for instance, uh, we set a certain goal and we somehow we didn't reach it. Uh, we can just tell ourselves, why can't we just be happy with uh, whatever it is? And on the other side, um, we are also encouraged to have this endurance or artitan. 
Uh, so, sh uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm confused of how to find the balance. I mean, just the fact that you're aware of that, you know, it's so easy to fall into exactly what you're saying to just, oh, this feels comfortable. And oftentimes meditation instructions are given in such a kind of cursory or very, um, with minimal guidance. So just, oh, just relax, just relax. Whereas that it, guidance can just easily turn into, you're just vegging out. You're just like leaning back on the sofa and um, kind of falling asleep. Um, so yeah, the Buddha Samatha is one of the um, enlightenment factors. So this tranquility is, or Pasadi um, synonym, is one of the enlightenment factors. And the Buddha said that you have to um, balance these different these different qualities. Um, so the Aditana is yeah, putting uh, determination into the practice, and you need to actively notice that. So noticing that if you're becoming unbalanced in a certain way that you are you know, maybe not as upright, the mind isn't as clear as it could be, and then applying the anecdote, antidote, which would be, um, yes, yeah, some more level of energy to the practice. The Buddha said it was like, if you are wanting to make a fire, and you've got a, um, a very small fire, you don't go and throw like wet leaves and wet branches and cow dung, wet cow dung on it. Um, that's similar to when the mind is sluggish, you don't just throw more serenity on it, don't throw more tranquility on it, but instead you put dry leaves, you put dry branches, uh, have some other kind of fuel that you put on it, and that's similar to adding uh, either energy or this determination or even bringing up joy into the practice, investigating something, so balancing out in that way. Yeah. Thank you. We do have to actually, we have a bit more this at the end of the session today, so we need to wrap up a little early. Um, thank you um, for this teaching. And maybe we could uh, read the blessing braid and dedicate our practice to those who need it.